Hello everyone, Thersites the Historian here. Today it is time for Sean Chick's Life of William Tecumseh Sherman, Part 2. Last time we looked at Sherman's life from his birth all the way up until the outbreak of the Civil War. Today in Part 2 we'll be looking at his service in that war from Bull Run all the way up until his rise to eminence in late 1863. He starts out this war as a colonel, and by the end of 1863, he finds himself as Sherman's most trusted and most independent lieutenant, someone who is bound to play a pivotal role in the war's conclusion. So how did Sherman get from just being one of many generals in the army to being someone so pivotal to the war effort? Today, we will find that out. Remember, as always, to like, comment, share, subscribe, click the notification bell, all of that stuff. I'm forced to say this now because of precipitous drops in revenue for no apparent reason. So go ahead and do that. And without any further ado, we will dig right in with this text. Bull Run, foreshadowing. Sherman was seemingly a broken man. His latest endeavor had failed. And, given his restless spirit, ambition, and the dissolution of his country, he took the failure rather hard. Sherman was not after money or even rank, so much as distinction. John Sherman had risen through the Whig and Republican ranks to become a senator from Ohio. He had nearly become Speaker of the House, and his early support for Lincoln meant he had the President's ear. So Sherman tried to gain a federal post, and barring that, a military commission. Sherman even met with Lincoln very briefly, but he came away unimpressed. He settled for a position with the St. Louis Railroad. Then came Fort Sumter. Sherman, although having no love for abolitionism, was a thoroughgoing nationalist in the mold of Daniel Webster, his political hero. While in St. Louis, he and his son were fired upon during a street skirmish with the secessionist militia. An angered Sherman returned to Washington a colonel declining a position in the War Department. Sherman worked on Winfield Scott's staff before being given a four-regiment brigade in the city's defenses. The unit of volunteers was considered among the best in the Army and included such famed regiments as the 69th and 79th New York. Three future generals were in its ranks. Sherman, although sloppy in dress, was an old Army snob, and he thought his men lacked discipline. He mostly relied upon Colonel Michael, Michael Corcoran, an Irishman who took soldiering seriously. Both men also shared a deep nationalism. Sherman went with the army as it moved south towards Bull Run, where the first great battle of the war was fought. Sherman did well at first. He found a ford on Bull Run, crossed it, and made a successful attack. Things unraveled from there. The second Wisconsin went into battle with gray uniforms and came under so much friendly fire that they broke. Colonel James Cameron, brother of Simon Cameron, the Secretary of War, fell dead leading a charge at the 79th New York. Sherman, like most Union officers that day, gradually lost control of his brigade, which was routed. Sherman redeemed himself when he led what was left of his brigade in a last stand, forming them into a square as Jeb Stewart's cavalry charged. This helped to cover the Union retreat, although Corcoran was wounded and captured in this action, ending what might have been a fruitful partnership. Sherman had done no better or worse than his fellow officers. His uneven performance at Bull Run mirrored his personality and career. Brilliant moments punctuated with failure. Kentucky, High Command and Mental Breakdown Sherman was at this stage a colorful but hardly inspiring figure. His brigade retired in better order than most at Bull Run, but it took two days for it to be combat ready, and morale deteriorated, with rumors of mutiny flying about. The 13th New York even refused to follow Sherman's orders. Sherman lost all faith in democracy, believing it made citizens too weak for war. Sherman was morose and moody, and he made no move to win over Lincoln when he toured Sherman's brigade. The president, regardless, took a liking to Sherman, which was not at all reciprocated. Still, Sherman's political and military connections shielded him from censure, unless he failed absolutely, and so far he had broken even. 
When Robert Anderson of Fort Sumter fame was sent west to Kentucky, he wanted Sherman as a second in command. Sherman accepted only reluctantly and with the assurance that he would never be made an army commander. This amused and impressed Lincoln, who was used to men demanding high command. In addition, Sherman also assured the president that George Thomas could be trusted with the command in Kentucky. The taciturn Thomas came from a slave-holding Virginia family and had not made his thoughts clear. Some feared he would go south. Others thought he was a Confederate spy. Sherman's support for Thomas was taken seriously since he was already noted for his blunt and honest manner. Thomas, for his part, felt he was forever in Sherman's debt and went with him to Kentucky. The situation in Kentucky was difficult. The state had declared neutrality, and they meant it. 71% of Kentucky males of military age were unengaged in the war, a higher percentage than any other state. Although Unionist sentiment was stronger than secessionist feelings, spies and guerrillas were everywhere, and much of the state's political elite went south. Sherman was sent south of Louisville, but his position was poor and his supply line was tenuous. Already growing nervous, he was then shocked when Anderson resigned due to illness. Sherman was now an army commander, and the responsibility overwhelmed him. Although Sherman's army was large, numbering nearly 60,000 troops, they were poorly trained, armed, and led. He managed to rein in some of the organizational and logistical chaos, yet to do so required long hours and Sherman's health failed. Then the press attacked him for his secrecy. His claim that he needed hundreds of thousands of men to conquer the South made him look mad to many. The Irish hero, Thomas Francis Meagher, publicly attacked him for his bull run conduct in a popular book. Meanwhile, Confederate General Albert Sidney Johnston made a series of aggressive maneuvers, mostly meant to keep Sherman on the defensive. Combined with other pressures, Sherman cracked just as Thomas was ready to seize Cumberland Gap and march into East Tennessee, which was then an outright rebellion against the Confederacy. Sherman ordered Thomas back, perhaps the greatest strategic blunder of his career. Sherman then asked to be relieved from a command he never wanted. He was replaced by Buell, who continued Sherman's organizational reforms, but ended the atmosphere of panic. Sherman was ridiculed in the papers and called insane. He turned inward and even considered suicide. Upon reporting to Halleck was in command of Union forces in St. Louis, he was given no responsibilities. Shiloh, Glory and Controversy A man with fewer connections might have been permanently shelved. But Sherman's friends and family rallied to him. Furthermore, he was a professional with combat experience in a war that had seen few battles. Sherman, once he recovered his senses, trained troops in St. Louis. Then he was sent to Cairo, Illinois, where he oversaw the forwarding of supplies to Ulysses S. Grant as he besieged Fort Donelson. Sherman was deferential to Grant in spite of outranking him. Grant, who valued loyalty and subordinate behavior more than anything else, took a liking to Sherman. In March 1862, Sherman was given a division of raw troops and sent on a raid south. The raid was a failure, and the new Secretary of War, Edwin Stanton, wanted him removed from active command but failed to get his way. Sherman remained and set up camp along the Tennessee River at Pittsburgh Landing. Throughout March, regiments varying from raw recruits to battlefield veterans arrived at the landing where the North's main Western Army was concentrated. Sherman mostly had free reign at Pittsburgh Landing, yet he failed to fortify the position or send out pickets, even as evidence mounted that an attack was imminent. When one officer brought up his fears, Sherman yelled, Take your damn regiment back to Ohio. There are no Confederates closer than Corinth. Why Sherman ignored all warnings remains a mystery, but possibly he was afraid of looking like an alarmist. His lack of concern was shared by many generals, particularly Grant, so there was no pressure on him to be alert. On April 6, 1862, Sherman was caught by surprise, and in the opening minutes of the battle his orderly was shot next to him. Hundreds of soldiers fled, and one of the regimental commanders deserted his unit after the first attack. Sherman, mounted on horseback and in the thick of the fighting, did not flinch. When shot in the hand, he merely bandaged it up. 
He even had two horses shot from under him. His men held out against the first fierce but uncoordinated attacks. Sherman was forced back from two defensive positions, then launched a counterattack that temporarily stemmed the tide. It had been a hellish day, and Sherman had seen the worst of it. That night, Sherman told Grant, We've had the devil's own day, haven't we? Grant calmly replied, Yes. Lick em tomorrow, though. Sherman played a major role in the next day's assault, attacking on several occasions and even leading the pursuit of the retreating rebel army. In the aftermath, Sherman was praised by all, and his reputation was saved while Grant was rightfully accused of failing to take proper defensive measures. Matters were made worse when Buell, whose reinforcements tipped the battle in Grant's favor, inflated his personal role in the victory, thus ending his friendship with Sherman. And the years ever after, Sherman went so far as to deny that he was even surprised. It was disingenuous, and he need not have gone quite that far. Rarely had history seen a commander behave so poorly before a battle, and so superbly during it. Sherman's actions at Shiloh more than made up for his previous blunders. Memphis, Occupation Blues in the aftermath of Shiloh, Grant was replaced with Thomas, which put Sherman in a difficult spot. For while Thomas bore Grant no ill will, Grant never forgave Thomas for the unintended slight. In addition, Halleck seemed ready to remove Grant completely, and while Lincoln and Stanton prevented Grant's censure, both men had lost faith in the hero of Fort Donelson. Throughout all of this, Sherman maintained his friendship with Grant, Halleck, and Thomas, but gradually sided more with Grant. After all, Thomas had done little to defend Sherman back when he was being called a lunatic, and Halleck had been condescending toward Sherman. So Sherman stood by Grant, and the two men became friends. Although strangely, Sherman thought Grant was not a particularly talented general or man. In a more honest moment, he declared that, I am a damn sight smarter man than Grant. I know more about military history, strategy, and grand tactics than he does. I know more about supply, administration, and everything else than he does. I'll tell you where he beats me, though, and where he beats the world. He doesn't give a damn about what the enemy does out of his sight, but it scares me like hell. Sherman liked Grant, and what was more to the point, he liked that Grant gave him a lot of latitude. By July 1862, things had cleared up. The Confederates had abandoned Corinth, Mississippi. Shortly thereafter, Memphis fell after a naval battle. Buell and Thomas went east to try to capture Chattanooga, while Halleck went to command all the Union armies. Grant had survived, but his force, now dubbed the Army of the Tennessee, was given a low priority in terms of supplies. For months, his men were kept on the defensive, and the battles of Iuka and Corinth gave neither Grant nor Sherman any glory. For Grant, it was due to bad luck, and the press's continued disdain for him. The hero of the hour was Rosecrans, who won Corinth. For Sherman, his newfound irrelevance was due to his posting in Memphis. For four months, Sherman ran the city. He could by turns be heavy-handed or lenient. This inconsistency defined Sherman and showed that he was in essence a reactive man. If he felt threatened, Sherman could be hard, such as in his orders to close down various newspapers. Yet, he won over some of the elites with his good manners, and the poor with his relief measures. At any rate, Sherman was more confident and was being considered for the command of the nearly 30,000 troops massing in New Orleans for the drive on Port Hudson. Sherman, however, decided that Vicksburg, Mississippi was the bigger prize. He would serve under Grant and not press Halleck and Lincoln for independent command. Vicksburg, right hand of victory. Vicksburg was a relatively small city that benefited from a rail connection and some high ground that dominated the Mississippi River. A force of some 30,000 men, the Confederacy's third principal field army, guarded the position. Sherman, now leading what would become the 15th Corps, was sent to take the city in December 1862. At Chickasaw Bayou, Sherman attacked and was repulsed with heavy losses. He told Halleck, I reached Vicksburg at the time appointed, landed, assaulted, and failed. 
Sherman unfairly blamed his subordinates, but he also began to see that frontal assaults were a waste. After the defeat, Sherman was put under the command of John McClernand. Before Fort Donaldson, McClernand had been a friend of Grant, but now the two were rivals. Sherman got along with McClernand at Shiloh, but the two were now enemies. However, eager to improve his standing, Sherman proposed an operation to take Fort Hindman, Arkansas, with help from David Porter's fleet. Despite Grant's misgivings and McLaren being in command, the operation was a success. Nearly 5,000 Confederates surrendered. It gave McLaren some glory, and Sherman's participation took away some of the shame from Chickasaw Bayou. Of course, McLaren and Sherman debated who was responsible. In hindsight, it is apparent that both men were in top form during the battle. Yet the battle was a bitter pill for Sherman to swallow. McLaren got most of the credit in the newspapers. In addition, David Stewart, one of Sherman's best commanders, was not confirmed as a general by the Senate. Stewart resigned in disgust. It was an act of political vindictiveness, and Sherman made his ire known to all who would listen. Calls to relieve Grant began anew, and he was regularly attacked in the newspapers. Many rightfully mocked his many fruitless bayou expeditions and a canal scheme overseen by Sherman that ended in thousands of sick soldiers. Desertion spiked, and two Illinois regiments had to be disbanded. Grant's new and daring plan was to land the army south of Vicksburg. The operation was supported by McLaren and opposed by Sherman. However, he acquiesced when Grant would not be deterred. Sherman was right to call it risky, but Grant had several advantages. His men were mostly veterans led by good battlefield generals. The Confederate command structure was a mess. Confederate President Jefferson Davis bickered with General Joseph E. Johnston, the theater commander. John C. Pemberton, the commander at Vicksburg, had not fought in a major battle. Benjamin Grierson's raid through Mississippi drew much of the Confederate horsemen away from Vicksburg, blinding Pemberton. A demonstration at Chickasaw Bayou by Sherman added to Confederate confusion. Sherman then joined the main army. He advised Grant during the advance and seized Jackson, Mississippi after a short battle. Following the victories at Champion Hill and Big Black River, Grant and Sherman thought the Confederates were demoralized, so Sherman made a direct attack on the city. It was a slaughter, and after a second grand attack, Grant settled for a siege. Sherman took no active role in Vicksburg's investment. Instead, he was given 36,000 men from three corps and ordered to keep tabs on an army that Johnston had gathered at Jackson. It was Sherman's first major independent command, and he did well. By July 4th, Vicksburg fell and Pemberton's army was paroled. Grant sent Sherman east to retake Jackson, which he accomplished, although he did not pursue Johnston. The normally aggressive Sherman was learning that attacking in the Civil War was tricky business, and he refused to assault unless he had a distinct advantage. Sherman's role in the victory at Vicksburg was arguably minimal. He was rarely in the vanguard of Grant's bold march, yet he accomplished much by capturing Fort Hindman, standing by Grant even when they disagreed, and handling much of the Army's logistics. As Grant's star rose, so would Sherman's, but it remained to be seen if Sherman would become a consistently successful general. Chattanooga. Missionary Ridge is a hard road to travel. The period after the fall of Vicksburg was idyllic. In the extreme summer heat, Grant paused to reorganize, refit, and rest his army while laying plans to take Mobile. Sherman's family visited him and he received a regular army promotion to Brigadier General. Then disaster struck. Grant fell from his horse at a review in New Orleans, thrusting Sherman into command and delaying the attack on Mobile. Sherman was unsure of himself and did nothing without consulting Grant. Then, at Chickamauga, south of Chattanooga, Bragg defeated Rosecrans's Army of the Cumberland. A more complete defeat had been prevented by Thomas's masterful defense, but the army was besieged in Chattanooga. Grant sent Sherman east with his 15th Corps. Just as he moved out, his son Willie grew ill and died. Sherman took the loss extremely hard and grieved until his dying day. Still, he carried out his orders, for the situation was dire. 
If Bragg was successful, the tide of rebel defeats at Gettysburg, Vicksburg, Port Hudson, and Tullahoma might yet be turned. The siege was lifted, but Bragg remained along the heights that dominated the city. Sherman's forces were given the task of turning the rebel right flank and driving them off Missionary Ridge. The operation was bungled from the start. Sherman took his wagon trains, slowing down the movement, and the terrain and roads were both poor. Much of this could be blamed on Sherman, who was all bluster before he began the maneuver, but failed to be meticulous in his planning. Still, hopes were high. On November 23rd, the Army of the Cumberland seized Orchard Knob, a Confederate advance position. The following day, Lookout Mountain fell. However, Sherman's flank attack was a farce. He moved too slowly, attacked an empty hill, and was then repulsed by Patrick Claiborne's elite division at Missionary Ridge. When he ordered to attack again, Sherman, knowing that the position was impregnable, made only a half-hearted attempt. In the end, the miraculous attack by the Army of the Cumberland won the day. In the aftermath, the rivalry between the Army of the Tennessee and the Army of the Cumberland grew by leaps and bounds. Grant protected Sherman from criticism, and at any rate, the victory made it to where few were asking any questions. Grant next ordered Sherman to move on to Knoxville, where the 23rd Corps was under siege. Sherman's command was worn out, and both bad roads and bad weather delayed his advance, but in the end, Knoxville was relieved. So it was that 1863 ended. Sherman's star had risen, but he had given a spotty accounting of himself. Some of it was due to grief over Willie's death. He also chafed at being in Grant's shadow, and perhaps felt lucky that despite his failures in disagreeing with Grant's methods, his friend had done nothing to reprimand him. In February 1864, Grant sent Sherman in the Mississippi to ravage the countryside, destroy supplies, and defeat the Confederate army there. Sherman managed to destroy the supply base at Meridian, Mississippi, but a supporting cavalry raid failed to aid him, and Sherman did not press into Alabama, and he also did not attack the Confederate army. To many Northerners, it looked like a failure. Yet the burning of Meridian made it hard for the Confederates to threaten Union positions along the Mississippi River. The capture of Meridian was a harbinger of Sherman's later campaigns.